Welcome to Hebraic Insights in the Gospels. Join us every Sabbath on Zion Road Radio for a look at the life, deeds, and words of Yeshua Messiah and his followers from the Torah-centric Hebraic perspective they were originally lived and written in. Today's program is on John chapter 16. Please get out your Bible and follow along. How do Messiah's words in John 16 reach down to our day when viewed from a national and prophetic perspective? What does Scripture say is the reason Yeshua Messiah came? What was his primary focus and purpose in the things he said and did? When Messiah said, I tell you these things so that you may have peace, What kind of peace was he talking about? What is the covenant of shalom with Israel that Messiah referenced, and how will Israel enter into its fullness? How vital is the Holy Spirit in the restoration of the remnant of Israel? Why should we, as the remnant nation of Israel, continually be open to receiving new revelation from the Holy Spirit until Messiah's return? And how is Yeshua Messiah working right now to rejoin and regather all the remnant tribes of Israel back into their land assembled as one nation united in Elohim's peace? Stay tuned throughout today's program for the answer to these questions and more in John chapter 16. And now, here's Eliyahu ben David with insight on that portion. Shalom, friends. We're fast approaching towards the end of the book of John and the end of our study of the Gospels. And what an amazing study it's been. And I think some of the best is still ahead of us. So I'm just filled with anticipation over this as we continue on. We have a theme, Shalom and the Ruach. So... Yeshua had a lot to say about that. We're going to look at that along with the rest of the things that he had to say in John chapter 16. And we've had more of a personal kind of view, which is very appropriate to read the verses in this way, because obviously Yeshua was about to meet his death. He was with the apostles who were going to be the foundation of the work, of the upcoming work. He was at the beginning of that long period in which the renewed Israel would be built up in the earth. And so it's very, very appropriate to look at it this way. However, as we look at these verses, we also find there is another level, not necessarily so obvious, and it's the national view, the long-term national view that is also to be found in these verses. And I wanted to share specifically about that. We want to remember that Yeshua came with a national purpose. He didn't come as some sort of a guru to make everybody feel better. That was not his purpose. He had a very distinct national purpose purpose. Before his birth, the angel spoke to Mary and said, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and will call his name Yeshua. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Adonai Elohim will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. 
So this is very specific as to why he was coming into the world, and the angel was announcing that. And at the heart of all of this is the house of Jacob. In other words, the nation of Israel, over which he would rule. That would be his kingdom. He would rule on the throne of David. And all of this is very specific. Looking further, when Zechariah, the priest, found out about this, this is what the Scripture says happened. Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, people were filled with the Holy Spirit at times before Pentecost. Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied. So these are words of Yahweh that are being spoken here, being prophesied by the Holy Spirit. And Zechariah said, Blessed be Adonai, the Elohim of Israel, for he has visited and worked redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been from old. See, what Zechariah is seeing is all the things that were promised about the Messiah were about to be fulfilled through him for Israel. And he says, among other things, to show mercy towards our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he spoke to Abraham. Again, carrying out those promises towards Israel. And it says, to grant us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, should serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. This represents a real change in Israel, doesn't it? It's talking about bringing Israel into a condition of real righteousness. So that is part of Yeshua's national purpose, very much pointing towards the nation and his role in the nation. And Yeshua, while he took up his ministry, constantly had this focus. He said in Matthew 15, 24, I wasn't sent to anyone but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This was his focus, Israel. And it shouldn't surprise us then when he sent out the twelve, he commanded them saying, don't go among the Gentiles, don't enter into any city of the Samaritans, rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So people who have been preconditioned in their thinking can read in the gospel and we'll read something like the kingdom of heaven, and they're thinking it's just talking about everybody and going off to heaven somewhere. But here, the kingdom of heaven he's talking about, as we saw from what the angel said, is the kingdom of David over the house of Jacob, over Israel. And that's why he was going to the lost sheep of Israel. That's why he sent the twelfth to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, I'm not saying that Gentiles were excluded. We know later on they came in. But we can't get away from this focus on Israel, that this was the primary reason why Messiah came. It's very clear from these verses that that was his principal work, his principal focus. He had a national purpose. That night that we're talking about, when he said the things that we've been reading in John chapter 14 through 16, that night is when he instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. And this was at the Passover celebration, the Passover celebration, of course, being a celebration of Israel. And what he said as he passed the cup to the twelve is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It was very specific. A new covenant with whom? 
why this is with the house of Israel. And he also said that night to those apostles, I confer on you a kingdom, even as my father conferred on me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. You will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So Israel is very much in view in all of this. This covenant is with Israel. The apostles, they're leaders of Israel. It's very clear there's a national purpose in view in what Yeshua was doing. And of course, the covenant in his blood, he's talking about his upcoming death. So everything he had to talk about, it has this theme in the background of his mission having to do with Israel. The Apostle Paul understood this. And interestingly, the Gentiles in Romans in Rome did not understand this. And as a matter of fact, this has been a major problem down through history, is the Gentiles have been slow to receive this understanding regarding Israel and even have wanted to push off the whole concept of Yeshua's relationship with Israel. And Paul explains this way what was actually going on. He says, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Even as it is written, there will come out of Zion the Deliverer, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant to them, when I will take away their sins. So Paul, again, is establishing that the new covenant with Yeshua Messiah has to do with Jacob, has to do with Israel to take away their sins so that all Israel can be saved. And we can see very much here a national purpose. His covenant is going to bring in all Israel. Well, these words in this discourse should be of interest to us. What is really the purpose, the reason that Yeshua is sharing these things that we've been reading all the way from chapter 14 now through verse 16? of John. Well, Yeshua says that his motive is peace, to bring peace to their hearts. The beginning of this discourse in John 14, 1, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in Elohim, believe also in me. In other words, he's talking about peace. We got a pretty good storm going here but we're going to weather the storm as long as the lights hold out. Um, the last verse of this discourse, interestingly, is reiterating the same thing here. He says, I've told you these things that in me you may have peace. I think it's very important when we're reading anything. We need to understand the context. We need to understand why are these things being stated. And obviously, he was wanting his apostles to have peace in view of what was about to happen, and by extension, all of us too. And overcomers have his peace. He says, in the world you have oppression, but cheer up, I've overcome the world. If he has overcome the world, he's suggesting we can overcome the world too. All of this is part of his motive in these words. And this has a personal application, but it has a national application also. So the word here in our translation of the Bible is the English word peace. But was Yeshua thinking peace or was he thinking shalom? And are the two things the same? 
Well, the Cambridge Dictionary says that peace is a period of freedom from war or violence. In other words, peace is not something that you assume to be constant. It's a period of freedom from war or violence. That's pretty limited in its scope. It can also mean calm and quiet, freedom from worry or annoyance, but again, that's a temporary state, and we expect that to change, and it does change from time to time. The online etymology dictionary tells us the source of the word peace, and it essentially means from its source freedom from civil disorder. And if you trace it back far enough, it comes from the Latin word pax. And that's a Roman word. And it has to do with a compact, an agreement, a treaty of peace, tranquility, absence of war. And the Roman word pax is very much a national kind of peace that it's talking about, often imposed by force of arms by the Romans. So is that what Yeshua was talking about when he said he was going to give us peace? Well, here's an interesting verse from the book of Isaiah that has a similar thought to it as what Yeshua was saying. This is Isaiah 26, 2 through 4. It says, open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, the one which keeps faith. Now, I think it's interesting that in these verses, it has the nation in view, not just an individual, right? Open the gates for the righteous nation to come in. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? The one which keeps faith. There's only ever been one righteous nation, and of course that is the nation of Israel. But not every generation of Israel has been righteous. So I think this verse is actually talking about the righteous generation of Israel. And it's defining it as the one which keeps faith. And it says, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because they trust in you. And it says, trust in Yahweh forever, for in Yah, Yahweh is an everlasting rock. The everlasting rock is Yeshua Messiah, through whom we receive our peace, through whom the righteous nation receives their peace by faith. Pretty amazing that these verses can be found here in the book of Isaiah, essentially foretelling what would happen because of Yeshua. Now, when it's saying peace here, of course, it doesn't use the English word in the original. It uses the word shalom. And the Hebrew word shalom means a state of being whole, complete, or full. So it's not really about peace treaties. It's about a state of being a complete state of being, basically having everything you need. That's a very different thing, isn't it? The Believer's Dictionary puts it this way, completeness, soundness, welfare, peace, safety, welfare, health, prosperity, quiet, tranquility, contentment, friendship of human relationships, with God especially in covenant relationships. So shalom also has to do with national peace, but not in the sense of just an absence from war, an actual completeness. And you see, this was Yahweh's idea towards his nation from the beginning. And that's what the Torah is all about, by the way, providing everything his nation needed to be complete to have everything they needed to have shalom. That's what it's all about. This is the kind of peace that Yeshua is talking about when he says that he's telling them these things so that they could have peace in him.
they could have shalom in him. It involves the national peace as well as the individual peace. So peace in him is his motive for all these things that he had to share. It's interesting if we look at the Greek word now that is used to translate what he said. And Thayer says this, this is the number one meaning, a state of national tranquility. I found that very interesting. Now it also has these other meanings, but its first and foremost meaning is national tranquility. And I've never heard anybody say that about these verses. I've always heard these verses as your personal kind of peace, which I'm sure is included. But that the primary meaning of the word is a national level. That makes sense to me. When you think about the mission of Yeshua from the very beginning towards his nation, of course he would be thinking in national terms towards his nation. He's the king. So while he's concerned for the individuals, he's concerned on the national level as well. And we should be too. There's more. I'm not reading all the verses, by the way. I'm picking some out that have to do with this. John 16, 12 through 13. I have yet many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. That means, friends, when you are reading the Gospels, Yeshua knows a lot of other things that he didn't say, that he didn't specifically say. Now, some of these things he's touching on, and if being farther along in the stream of time, you have some understanding of those things, you can see where he's actually referring to those things. But he didn't explain them in detail because they weren't ready. Well, just think about that. Think about their mission. They were essentially starting out, right? So they were at the foundation level. When you are at the foundation level, you're not thinking very much about building the roof. You're thinking about building the foundation, and that's what they were doing. They were building the foundation. So Yeshua was dealing with them on that level, that those are the things they needed to know about. Of course, we need to know about the foundation too. When you build the roof, you have to already know about the foundation, don't you? Because the roof depends on the foundation. But when you're building the foundation, you really don't have to know much about the roof. Kind of interesting. So there was much that Messiah did not say to his apostles. It's very possible that you might know more about the scriptures than they did. It's very possible because they couldn't bear everything that Yeshua had to share. We have to understand this, because, you know, there are some people, they call it being orthodox. And what they do, this is something you find in different religions, in different denominations, too. Many times they'll have a creed, and their creed will tell you, this is what the scriptures mean. They'll have a list of things, for instance, the Trinity doctrine and other things. And that's what you have to believe. That's what you have to believe. And if you bring up something else that's not on the list, you are highly suspect. Because that's what's written in stone. That's what we've got. That's the truth. Well, there are core teachings that are the truth. Don't get me wrong about that. You can't change the truth. However, Yeshua went on and said, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. 
Now, he already said he didn't tell the apostles everything, right? So are you going to find everything revealed there? Doesn't this really mean, then, that until he returns, the Spirit is going to continue to guide us into more truth? Isn't this talking about, then, a process of unfolding revelation as time goes by? Shouldn't it be that if we are alive in the Ruah, the Holy Spirit, that we should be having new revelation? And shouldn't it be if we're not, something's wrong? Really, if what you have and all you have is just a list of beliefs that everybody has to believe and you can't learn anything new beyond that, what you've got is dead religion. You don't have something where there is this unfolding revelation of the Holy Spirit. And are we open to that? Are we open to having the Spirit of truth guide us into all truth? Well, you know what? Some truth is very uncomfortable. It's a really big temptation when the Holy Spirit has led you to things that are more advanced, that are more uncomfortable, to say, well, that's too scary. I'm going to stop here. Some people do that. I don't recommend that. Because I believe we need to know all that he wants to reveal to us. There's a reason. If he is revealing things, even if they are scary to us, there's a reason he's revealing it to us. Think about Yeshua in this discourse to these apostles. What is he telling them? The world is going to hate you. They're going to kill you. They're going to throw you out of the synagogue. Is that what you tell people that are just getting started? Why did he tell them that? They needed to know it. Otherwise, they'd be caught by surprise. Sometimes we need to know scary stuff, don't we? It's for our own good. So we need to move with the Spirit as more truth is revealed to us. This is what Yeshua is showing us here. There is a process of unfolding truth until everything is finally revealed. When is everything finally revealed? Well, obviously, logic tells you that happens at the very end, right? Put some water in a glass. When is the water full? It is at the very end, right? That's when we have all truth, finally at the very end, at the end of the age. Well, the scriptures indicate we're living in the final generation. Shouldn't we be seeing scads of truth being revealed to us? That's why we have a lot of things that people haven't known in the past. Because it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, doing exactly what Yeshua said what happened. Now, I also want to mention it says he will guide you. Some people have this idea in their head that the revelation of truth by the Holy Spirit is something where it's all completely certain and everybody knows all the truth. And by definition, that can't be true if we believe in what Yeshua is saying here. Because if the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth, then obviously you start out from a place where you don't know all truth. So it is a process of revelation. That means that believers are mistaken about some things. You know, the apostles, we're going to find this in the book of Acts, the apostles said to Yeshua after the resurrection, are you setting up the kingdom of Israel on the earth now? They were thinking, okay, he's, he's gone, he's died for Israel. It's time for the kingdom of Israel to be reestablished right now. 
Well, they missed a lot of stuff. There's a lot of prophecies that they didn't understand yet. And so they were mistaken. But did that stop them from being the apostles and doing their job? So, you know, we don't want to have this religious kind of thinking. Like we can never be wrong about anything. We can never learn something new. Because that is exactly not what Yeshua said would happen. There's a revelation process where we keep learning more and our understanding of the truth keeps being more perfected as we're led along. And something else he said is, he will declare to you things that are coming. You don't need to know things that are coming if they're not going to happen in your generation. Why do you need to know that? You need to know what you have to deal with. So, even though the apostles had some words of prophecy and so on, you don't find really them dealing with that a great deal. Because they had their hands full getting things off the ground in the first century. Those of us here at the end of the age, do we need the Holy Spirit to declare to us the things that are coming? Boy, do we ever. Because just like those apostles needed to be prepared for their job in the first century, we need to be prepared for our job. Getting through this final generation and accomplishing all Yahweh's purpose for us and the spirit of truth will help us do that. And he is, in fact, helping us do that. Now, here's an interesting thing I was noting, that from the national perspective now, Yeshua's words and what he had on his mind reaches down to Judgment Day. It wasn't just for the first century, although he was focusing on giving them the things they needed. But it says, when he has come, he will convict the world. Now, I find this very interesting because on praying about this and considering this, I came to realize that this is not talking about the conviction that believers feel, certainly not on the national level that we're talking about. This is talking about what happens with the world. Sin because they don't believe in me. That certainly was true in the first century of the unbelieving Jews, and they were convicted and sentenced and the sentence was executed in the year 70. What about our world today and the end of the age? Shouldn't we expect something similar to happen? About righteousness, because I'm going to my father. He's not here in the world anymore teaching people about righteousness. And the world is not receiving righteousness. Just read the newspaper, and you'll know what I'm talking about. They're convicted. This is why, by the way, they want to force you to accept things that are unrighteous, because they don't want to believe their sin. They're being convicted by the Holy Spirit, and they won't accept it. That's what's happening. And about judgment, because the prince of this world has been judged. Yes, Satan has been judged. What comes next? When does this come due? Does this not come due at the end of the age? And you know what? While I was studying this, all of a sudden I heard this little voice say, wow, this is the seven seals being opened. I'm not saying this wasn't going on all along, but in a very specific way, this is the seven seals being opened in the book of Revelation. These are indeed convictions of the Holy Spirit. 
where God is trying the world. And we've been seeing it going on as an amazing spectacle to the world, all of these things, all these things, sin, conviction against unrighteousness, judgment against the world. We're seeing this unfolding before our eyes as these seals of the book of Revelation are being opened. So this does have a very specific national kind of meaning at the end of the age. Now I'm going to look at a few verses that talk about a covenant of shalom. And this is in Isaiah 54 that we're going to focus. And first we're going to look at Yeshua's words. He says, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she gives birth, has sorrow because her time has come. But when she's delivered the child, she doesn't remember the anguish anymore for the joy that a human being is born into the world. Now, of course, Yeshua is applying this to these apostles and what's going to happen with them. But where does this particular figure come from regarding the pregnant woman having anguish and then having joy? This is all from the prophets. And there's a number of places where we find this, but one of these we find in Isaiah 54, 1 through 3. And here we have the barren woman who gives birth. And it says, For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. And it says that her seed shall possess the nations and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. And it says, the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. Now, we have a number of other verses in Revelation 12. It's talking about the same thing. Jeremiah chapters 30 through 33 refer to this same idea about the pregnant woman. And there are other prophetic verses too. All of them, all of them having to do with the restoration of the nation of Israel. In Isaiah 54, it goes on here with these thoughts. For a small moment have I forsaken you, but with great mercies will I gather you. This is talking about the tribes of Israel that were dispersed throughout the world, assimilated into all the world. And Yahweh's thinking of this as a small moment. You know when this happened? About 2,500 years ago? More than that. It's a small moment to Yahweh. And he says, with great mercies will I gather you. Are we to take that seriously? That the tribes of Israel were scattered throughout the world? Obviously, they haven't been regathered. One tribe has. Are we to take this seriously? I take it seriously. It's the Word of God. In overflowing wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness will I have mercy on you, says Yahweh, your Redeemer. And he says, As I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I will not be angry with you nor rebuke you. And he says, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my loving kindness shall not depart from you, neither shall my covenant of shalom be removed, says Yahweh, who has mercy on you. In the context here in Isaiah 54, this is very clearly talking about the scattered tribes of Israel, that there's a covenant of shalom that is made with them. What covenant is that? Since Yeshua came with the renewed covenant, 
Is there any covenant that's going to replace that covenant? He did that. This covenant of shalom with scattered Israel is that same covenant that he instituted with those apostles that night. It will be by the power of that renewed covenant that Israel will experience these very things that the scriptures are talking about here. It's just in the first century, they hadn't come to the place in the timeline for that to happen. We're at that now, in the final days. In Ezekiel 34, it also mentions the covenant of Shalom. And again, what is it talking about? Here we have a covenant of shalom with Israel. And Yahweh is speaking to Ezekiel. He says, The word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Now, it uses this term towards Ezekiel throughout this prophecy, son of man. Have you ever heard that before? I think it's pretty clear from that title that in this prophecy, Ezekiel is standing in the place of Yeshua Messiah. He's a prophetic figure of the coming Messiah. And he's prophesying against the shepherds of Israel. Do you know anybody called the Son of Man that prophesied against the shepherds of Israel besides Ezekiel? Did not Yeshua come and do exactly that? And it goes on, tell them, behold, I'm against the shepherds, and I'll require my sheep at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the sheep. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore, and I will deliver my sheep from their mouth, that they may be food for them. Now, this literally happened in the first century because of the work of Yeshua and the separation work that he instituted. The remnant were brought out, and they were saved, but those wicked shepherds and all that followed them had to endure the terrible punishment that came in the year 70. So we can easily see that Ezekiel, as the Son of Man, prefigured the Messiah in this role. Well, there's more here in this chapter. The prophecy says, Behold, I myself, even I, I will search for my sheep that are scattered abroad. I will deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. Well, did this happen in the first century? Did Yahweh gather all of the scattered sheep of Israel and bring them back to the land of Israel? We know historically this has not happened. So this is an aspect of the prophecy that goes beyond what Yeshua did in the first century that looks ahead to what eventually would happen, things to come, right? when Yahweh would gather his sheep together and bring them out of all the countries where they've been scattered, all the countries, and bring them into their own land. Is there anything ambiguous about that? Is it unbelievable? Well, apart from faith, it is unbelievable. Because we would think after all of this time and them being assimilated throughout all these countries that this would be impossible. But by Yahweh's Spirit, it's not impossible. And he will fulfill this and is fulfilling this in these days. And it goes on here in Ezekiel 34, saying, I will set up one shepherd over them, even my servant David. I will make with them a covenant of peace, 
they shall be secure in their land. This covenant of peace or covenant of shalom with Israel is talking again about the same thing, right? It's the renewed covenant that Yeshua made that very night when he spoke all the things in these verses we've been reading. It's a covenant of shalom for the scattered sheep of Israel. Now, does that mean that other people can't enter into it and everything that we've ever heard about that? No. It doesn't mean that other people can't come under that covenant. But it definitely, as we see in this prophecy, refers to this specific thing that Yahweh would do in regathering his nation, remnant Israel, and that covenant by Yeshua's own blood is our guarantee that it will happen and he will bring us back into our own land under David. In other words, the son of David, Yeshua Messiah. Ezekiel 37 also mentions a covenant of shalom. Are you seeing a pattern here? This is really important because here it's showing us that this regathering of the remnant nation is a work of the Ruach, the Spirit, that Yeshua was talking about. John 16, 7, now looking at this from the National View. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the counselor won't come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. You see, what the prophets clearly show is that the restoration of Israel comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. If Yeshua did not give us the Holy Spirit, then this prophecy could not be fulfilled. That is the way in which Yahweh is working. So it's very interesting. Yeshua very well may have had this national concept in mind as well. He said, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will declare to you things that are coming. So Yeshua is thinking about things that are coming and what the Spirit is going to do. This is like the biggest thing, right, that the Spirit is going to do is regather Israel. Now let's see how Ezekiel brings that up. Here, Ezekiel 37, 1 and 2. The hand of Yahweh was on me, and he brought me out in the spirit of Yahweh. Very much the spirit, or the ruah, is involved here. And this, of course, is the vision of the valley of dry bones. Very many, very dry. If you went out into a valley that was scattered with dry bones, are you expecting those bones to come together and become people again? That's about as likely as it is for all of the scattered remnant throughout all the countries of the world to rise up as Israelites and come together as his nation again. I don't think you could have a better picture of that. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. One tribe? No. All the tribes, the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean, cut off. A lot of us have felt that way. We don't belong in the world. And we really have no place to go, and we have no hope in the world other than our future hope. <sighs> Prophesy and tell them, Behold, I'll open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. 
and I'll bring you into Eretz Israel. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. This is why the Holy Spirit had to be poured out for Yeshua to fulfill all that he was called to do so that the whole house of Israel could be restored by the Holy Spirit that we might live again as a nation before Yahweh. He says, and you shall know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, says Yahweh. This is what it's for. To glorify him, that only he could do it. This is all part of his amazing plan. Ezekiel 37 goes on, You, son of man, take one stick and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them for you, one to another, into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. Well, if anyone thinks there's any ambiguity here, this removes any that people might have, because it's very specific. This is not about the Christian church, is it? This is not even about the Jewish world. Judah is mentioned along with the children of Israel, his companions. In other words, perhaps some others from some of the other tribes that are with Judah. And then the other stick for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. You know, Ephraim was the leading tribe of the ten tribe kingdom that was deported. So it's talking about them. So between these two, Judah and Joseph, it's talking about the entire house of Israel. And it says they'll be joined together, not as two sticks, but as one stick, that they may become one in your hand. Now, once again, we're realizing Ezekiel, the son of man, is standing here for Yeshua. It's Yeshua that brings these two sticks together as one in his hand, one nation in his hand. And he does it through the work of the Spirit in making the nation live. This is national peace that our nation never had. All together as one nation in the hand of Yeshua. Tell them, thus says Adonai, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, in case you didn't get it already, now it specifically says the tribes of Israel. And I will put them with it, even with a stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they should be one. This is such a clear promise that has never been fulfilled, that is promised to be fulfilled in the final days. And clearly, this is peace in Yeshua Messiah for his nation. Now, in Ezekiel 37, Yahweh goes on and explains all of this so clearly. He says, Behold, I'll take the children of Israel from among the nations where they are gone, and I'll gather them 
on every side and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land. You know, a lot of folks can't get that. They just can't get that. They can't see themselves as returning to the land. They don't think that that can really happen. It must be, I don't know, spiritualized somehow. It isn't. It isn't. And as we meditate on his word, our heart can change about this. We can see that this is our land where we belong. And as you see that, you begin to live. You begin to yearn to be returned to your land. It's your land to be planted once again with your nation on your land that Yahweh gave you. What other place do you have that is truly yours? I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. I will save them out of their dwelling places, will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their Elohim. This is the ultimate peace for his nation in this earth. My servant David shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my ordinances and observe my statutes and do them. They shall dwell in the land that I've given to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived. And they shall dwell therein, they and their children and their children's children forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. The prince of peace, the prince of shalom, the son of David, their prince, their king. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace, that is shalom, with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tent also shall be with them and I'll be their Elohim and they shall be my people. The nations shall know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary shall be in their midst forevermore. A covenant of shalom an everlasting covenant for the redeemed, regathered tribes of Israel, one nation in the land. That is all in view in what Yeshua was doing that night in instituting the renewed covenant. And it's in view in the things that he said, even if not in the forefront. It's there. It's there. And the Holy Spirit, here in these last days, has led us into this truth to understand who we are and what Yahweh is doing in these days by His Spirit with His nation. John 16, 31 through 33. I've told you these things that in me you may have shalom. In the world you have oppression, but cheer up, I've overcome the world. Now, this is a great message for the last days, isn't it? Because we are under oppression, and let me tell you what, this oppression is growing. Even in the developed world, you are losing your rights daily. You are coming under more and more oppression every single day. There have always been oppressors, but there's never been technology to keep track of every person all the time. Now they have that. 
the oppression is going to continue to grow and it's going to be a crushing oppression. You think it was bad for the Israelites in Egypt? This oppression is going to become far worse than that because technology makes that possible. But in him, we can have shalom. Particularly when he takes us out of all the nations, back to our home, into a place of safety where he is shepherding us, protecting us from that. A promise. So he says, cheer up, I've overcome the world. And he did. And he made all of this possible for us. And he calls us to be overcomers too. Revelation 2, 25 through 29 is one of the many verses there that talks about overcomers. Hold that which you have firmly until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my works to the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, shattering them like clay pots. That sounds like victory. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Shalom in the Ruach. You have been listening to Hebraic Insights in the Gospels. That's the end of today's program. Some of the scripture verses referenced in today's program include John chapter 16, Luke chapter 1, verse 31 through verse 33, Luke chapter 1, verse 67 through verse 75, Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through verse 7, Luke chapter 22, verse 20, Luke chapter 22, verse 29 through verse 30, Romans 11, verse 25 through verse 27, John chapter 14, verse 1, Isaiah 26, verse 2 through verse 4, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1 through verse 10, Jeremiah chapter 30 through chapter 33, Revelation chapter 12, Ezekiel 34, verse 1 through verse 13, Ezekiel 34, verse 23 through verse 27, Ezekiel 37, verse 1 through verse 2, Ezekiel 37, verse 11 through verse 23, and Revelation chapter 2, verse 25 through verse 29. Further teachings and study materials on Yeshua Messiah and his mission as the King of Israel, the work that Yeshua Messiah is doing with Israel in our generation, the leadership order of the Kingdom of Israel that Messiah established with the Twelve, how believing Gentiles were grafted in to become literally a part of that nation of Israel and leadership of renewed Israel, the rebellious schisms away from that leadership and how they became the modern-day religions of Judaism and Christianity, along with more on how these events were prophesied beforehand and why we must return to the ancient ways that Messiah was teaching his disciples, the timing of the remnant exodus and why it didn't happen in the first century, the covenant of Shalom or the renewed covenant, our verse-by-verse study of the Torah and how to keep it in truth through the power of the Holy Spirit and not religious legalism, the remnant of Israel, the restoration and regathering of the remnant of Israel, the role and purpose of the restored remnant of Israel in these last days, and more on end times prophecy, along with many other teachings and topics, can all be found at our membership site, Zion Tabernacle. Sign up is free. Just go to zion.net. That's T-S-I-Y-O-N dot N-E-T. New programs on the Gospels will be airing every Sabbath right here on Zion Road Radio. Join us next Shabbat to learn more Hebraic insights in the Gospels. Shabbat Shalom. Stand at the crossroads and look 
The Christian church system has claimed that Israel is cast off and done away with. However, Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 35 through verse 37 says, Thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, says Yahweh, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says Yahweh, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, then will I also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says Yahweh. The sun is still here. The sea still roars, and the stars still shine. Learn how Yahweh's nation Israel is literally written in the stars as a permanent testimony of our God's commitment to His covenant with Israel. Visit our community site, Zion Tabernacle, and sign up as a free member to view Eliyahu ben David's seminar entitled, One Nation Written in the Stars. Now available free of charge as part of Zion Fast Track, our introductory video course. Zion Fast Track will give you the big picture of what God is doing with His remnant nation in this very generation. To sign up and learn more about what other free resources you'll get as a Zion Tabernacle member, go to zion.org and click Join Us. That's T S I Y O N. Dot O-R-G. Then click Join Us. Has God put it on your heart that you may be a part of the remnant of Israel? Have you ever wondered what the order of the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7 is? How about the order of the tribes on the stones of the high priest's breastplate? Learn the answer to these questions and more in Eliyahu ben David's five-part video series entitled The Remnant Tribes of Israel Seminar. Plus, learn the basic function of each division in the order of the tribes of Israel and which division your tribe belongs to. This seminar can go a long way in helping you to see the big picture of where you fit in to the order of Yahweh's remnant nation. View the seminar free of charge at our membership site, Zion Tabernacle. To sign up and learn more about what other free resources are available to you at Zion Tabernacle, Go to zion.org and click Join Us. That's T-S-I-Y-O-N dot O-R-G. Then click Join Us.